Sir Andrew Gergana, the floor is yours. Uh, Jim, sir, thanks very much. It's, um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be part of the conference this morning. Thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I think you're going to control my presentation for me. Our pleasure and honor too. We are now continuing with the keynote lecture entitled Using Evidence to Drive Innovation. And just a few words about Sir Dylan. Sir Dylan held several senior management positions in the UK National Health Service, including General Manager of Royal Free Hospital and Chief Executive of St. George Hospital, both academic health centers in London. He was the founding chief executive of the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence in England from 1999 to 2020. And he is now is a visiting professor in the Institute of Global Health Innovation, Imperial College, and work as an independent consultant. Sir Dylan, once again, it's an honor and pleasure to have you here today, and the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, Gordon. It's again just to say it's a great uh, it's great to be invited to join you. Um, and and my, my presentation this morning is going to focus on some of the challenges that face both um, innovators and health systems in getting innovation into practice, the really important things, some of which we've been hearing about this morning that have the potential to make so much difference to patients. And if we move on to the first slide, um, I guess the first thing to say here is that I, I don't think there's anything revelatory um, in this list of challenges, um, and it's not exhaustive, uh, but I think it includes some of the main barriers that we all face in getting new technologies to patients. And perhaps I ought to say that uh, this slide and the rest of what I'm going to say draws, of course, on my experience in a particular Western uh, European healthcare system. Um, and so that experience is incomplete when it comes to the challenges that are faced by health systems and companies working elsewhere in the world. But I still think there are some important general lessons that we can apply wherever there's a sort of considered approach to evaluating the potential of new health technologies for improving the health status of a population wherever it is in the world. So here's four things that I think are really important. First of all, there's, I think, a misalignment between the risk appetites and the ambitions um, of uh, companies that develop health technologies and the health systems that they're working with. And what I mean by that is that um, the um, uh, the, the the risk that companies take in investing enormous uh, resources, including human capital, into developing technologies. We've been hearing about some of that this morning uh, with some of the newer technologies that are coming through. Um, requires a return, um, which is um, important and valid. And for health systems, um, matching that with resources that require them to allocate equitably across all disease areas uh, and requires most healthcare systems to make choices about where they invest um, is based on a slightly different risk appetite. Um, and the misalignment between those two things, um, I think, is a real challenge uh, in ensuring that the best of the new technologies that we're seeing get through. And the evidence for innovation, uh, the evidence for the clinical and economic value of new technologies is inevitably uh, incomplete and frequently quite immature at the point at which quite significant decisions have to be taken by health systems to invest in those new technologies. So again, an enormous risk being taken by both those who are delivering the technologies, but particularly at the point of introduction by healthcare systems that have to allocate sometimes quite scarce resources um, in order to uh, enable access for their citizens to those technologies. Um, I think a key problem is that the engagement between companies and health systems decision makers um, that enables uh, these really critically important, sometimes very expensive decisions to be taken um, is uh, often too late. Uh, there's an enormous opportunity that's frequently missed for companies and health systems to talk earlier about the potential of new things coming through company pipelines, uh, the potential to improve uh, health to meet priorities of healthcare systems um, early in the process that enables uh, the risks that have been taken by both parties to be assessed and mutually understood 
uh, and a process put in place to start managing those risks in order to enable the technologies to get uh, into place and the benefits uh, delivered to patients. And I know that everybody knows these things, <clears throat> but the solutions seem to me to be quite elusive, despite the fact that um, in many parts of the world, uh, there's a heavily engineered process for uh, health systems engaging with life sciences companies to manage the introduction of new technologies. We still seem to be missing some really important issues and it is generating, uh, I think, both significant risk. It's generating missed opportunities and delays in technologies getting to patients. Um, and it's continuing to sort of foster a kind of mutual suspicion. Uh, on the part of the two key parties, companies that healthcare systems just don't get it, are putting barriers in place that it's all about budgets and money and not about improving the health status of the population. Um, and health systems suspicious that companies are driving technologies into healthcare systems, sometimes with marginal benefits uh, and always ultimately with profit as the principal motivation. It's not as simple as that. But it's interesting if we look at the next slide, how sometimes this gets captured. So we move on to the next slide. It's coming, yeah. Great, thanks very much. Um, this slide, the quotes in uh, this slide and the next slide are getting a little bit dated. This is from 2018, so four years ago. Um, but I think it's still, and, and it applies specifically to pharma, but I think it's I think it's nevertheless still relevant right across uh, the piece uh, in the relationship between life sciences and um, health systems. This is Paul Workman, who is the is the chief executive UK Institute for Cancer Research, um, arguing that essentially that the ecosystem for drug discovery and the uh, roles played by regulators, researchers, companies is just too risk averse. Um, it's essentially defaulting to a position in which uh, if there just isn't enough data to enable a clear determination about the value of new technologies, uh, then the thing to do is just to say no uh, or to delay, uh, ask for more information, all of which is um, putting back the point at which effective new innovations can start to benefit patients. So that's a particular perspective. If we go on to the next slide, you can see a different perspective. This is um, from the uh, British Medical Journal. Um, again, this is um, back in, um, uh, around, it's in 2017 that this was published. So five years ago, but again, I think still has relevance. So you can see there a piece of work that was done to look at uh, 68 cancer drug indications approved in Europe uh, between 2009 and 2013. And on their analysis, uh, almost 60% entered the market without evidence of survival or quality of life benefits. Uh, and even when the drugs did show those survival gains over available treatment option, most of them weren't clinically meaningful. Um, now, some of these things, uh, uh, in fact, the, the totality of the way value of new health technologies is interpreted, uh, depends on the perspective you apply, it depends on the ambition that you've got, and it depends on the risk appetite. Uh, but nevertheless, um, this indicates that there is a real tension between those who think that healthcare systems particularly uh, are too risk averse, and those who think that healthcare systems uh, are actually investing in new technologies where there's insufficient value demonstrated at the point at which they're making their decisions. And somehow we've got to find a way to resolve this, uh, 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 the different, the, the, these different perspectives, somehow bring the perspectives of innovators and healthcare systems closer together. Um, and that requires, uh, I think, um, the sorts of things that we've been hearing about from our previous speakers, from Sabalia, who talked about the importance of HTA uh, in uh, shoring access to um, new vaccines. Um, uh, Prasi Mira was talking about some really exciting new technologies that have enormous potential benefits and Paul about the importance of collaboration between stakeholders in order to enable decisions to be taken that are ultimately in the interests of patients. 
But whatever way we do it, um, evidence is absolutely critical. And if we move on to the next slide, we can see that um, in order, in, in the process of generating that evidence and in the conversations that take place between everybody who's involved in it, that the irony of, of what we, of what of, of often the experience that we've got is that um, because these treatment choices are made at the, the end of a long chain of decisions, uh, right from the point of basic research through those early stage, uh, early stage research and development, uh, and then the critical decisions that are taken by investors and companies uh, and through the process of regulation and ultimately decision and adoption, is that instead of risk reducing over that period, it, it seems frequently that risk just grows uh, over that period of time. And the more risk that exists in a process of decision making, the more cautious the players are going to be, uh, and therefore the more difficult it is to reach potentially reach a decision ultimately in the interests of patients. And it becomes more complex if each of the players involved is defining what they mean by value and assessing risk in their own way. Um, and they're trading them off in the context of the ambitions and constraints under which they work. Um, Everyone says that they want to improve outcomes for patients, uh, and everybody means it. Um, but the other incentives that drive them um, are not always aligned um, and can result in delays in technologies getting through to patients. And then we have a problem where investors and companies can prioritize disease targets that offer rapid revenue streams and cancer dominates. Uh, um, perhaps inevitably, but the reality is that certainly in Western healthcare systems, cancer is dominating the pipelines for many companies. And the health systems, of course, have a whole range of priorities and a commitment to support our needs or the needs of their insured population across the whole range of demands that are made on them. Um, and uh, of course, some of those disease areas are less commercially attractive uh, to companies than uh, others. So again, there's a sort of potential mismatch between the ambitions that companies have to develop technologies uh, and make an appropriate return and the ambitions that healthcare systems have got and indeed the responsibility that they've got uh, to deliver value across the whole range of diseases and conditions to the people that they're responsible for. And then there's also a tension between um, the decisions that regulators made as they look at value in new treatments through uh, positive effects on, on clinically relevant markers, but health systems, although they may recognize that uh, those uh, potential, those positive uh, benefits are there, um, uh, may, may see the clinical benefits ultimately to be modest, that therapeutic gain relative to the price, the cost that companies are asking health systems to pay for those new technologies is insufficient. So we've got a chain of decision making, of ambitions and different approaches to risk that are uh, not compatible um, and uh, somehow need to be exposed and reconciled in order ultimately for efficient decision making to take place. We move on to the next slide. Um, and it's not uh, an exhaustive list, but I think that for innovation to succeed, the value proposition that companies bring to healthcare systems needs to be able to, uh, first of all, address uh, things that are priorities for healthcare systems. Um, they need to be confident that they materially improve outcomes for patients, um, and ideally, that they have the potential for improving health system efficiency. Um, the combination of those three things um, is likely to get uh, new technologies past the first and critical and mo critically the most important and difficult parts of the decision making process and getting technologies adopted into healthcare systems. And the data package that companies need to bring needs to directly underpin the claims that are made for the technology. So there needs to be real evidence that that therapeutic gain that a company is claiming for a new technology is there. Uh, there's got to be some way for healthcare systems to be able to compare the new technology with what they're using at the moment. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be a direct comparison, but if it's an indirect comparison, the techniques used to um, uh, make that comparison uh, need to be valid and convincing. 
there needs to be data uh, uh, built in or a process built into the clinical trial so that uh, the impacts of, of the technology on, on health-related quality of life is captured. Um, and in order for that to happen, there has to be real and meaningful demonstration in the process of conducting clinical trials uh, with patients uh, or those who speak from, uh, for them so that their perspective on the benefits of the technology uh, have been clearly taken into account. And then critically for healthcare systems, um, it's very important that they have uh, the best understanding they can at the point at which a new technology is being introduced um, about how the organization sequencing of care might change um, and what the impacts of those changes might be on the cost of care. So the people that are involved in it, the location in which care is delivered, the facilities that need to be put in place uh, in order for the technology to be used and for its benefits to be uh, delivered to patients. So it's not a comprehensive list, but I think these components need to be in place in order to get to the point at which innovation is successfully introduced into healthcare systems. And then just moving to the final slide, um, I think these are the conditions for success broadly. Uh, healthcare systems have got a responsibility to be clear about what their priorities are. What is it that they're looking for? Um, how are they going to uh, assess the technologies that are presented to them? What incentives do they have in place for companies to bring the technologies that they're looking for into the healthcare system? And what support can they offer companies uh, that are prepared to partner up with them to deliver what? Uh, those uh, healthcare systems are looking for. There needs to be a sustainable value proposition from companies. As I've just been saying, it's enormously important that there's enough in the initial evidence package that companies bring to be able to, to allow healthcare systems to recognise that there's enough there to enable them to take a risk to put their scarce resources into place to use that technology. Upstream engagement, early engagement is absolutely essential. Could be in the form of scientific advice between regulators and companies. It could be in the form of conversations with HTA agencies about what they need, uh, or with those who are ultimately going to fund technologies uh, with market access advice. But the earlier that that dialogue takes place, um, the better that we can manage risk and align ambitions between companies and healthcare systems. We've got to have approval processes in health systems that recognize the nature of the technologies that are coming through. Um, we were hearing earlier this morning about the new science that's underpinning some really exciting new technologies. Uh, and so the frameworks, the methodologies that are used where they are used in healthcare systems to inform decision making that reveals clinical value and economic benefits need to be designed in order to take advantage uh, or to recognize and to be able to deal with the new forms of evidence that are underpinning these new technologies. Uh, closer working between regulatory and evaluative agencies, really important to improve efficiency and reduce the elapsed time between technologies becoming available and them getting to patients. Um, and then ultimately, partnership, collaboration between companies and healthcare systems uh, that uh, can take into account uh, and manage the risk associated with uncertainty at the point at which new technologies are being put into place. So not defaulting to just saying we don't know enough about it, so we can't say yes, uh, but recognizing where there's real potential uh, that if there isn't enough data, uh, then uh, working with companies to generate that information inside the healthcare system whilst allowing access on a managed basis to those patients who have the potential for benefit is important and should be put in place. So again, thanks very much for the opportunity of joining you this morning. I hope that was interesting and very happy to take any questions anybody might have. Thank you, Sir Dylan, for the brilliant talk. It was really interesting. There are a few questions in the chat section for the audience, but I will start with this one. In your last slide, you presented several conditions for success in the process of using evidence to drive innovation. But could you also share a story of success of which these principles are applicable or work? Is there a, is there a pilot project, a country, or a case that 
these principles are applied and they show they work? Well, uh, a lot of countries where there is a, a process where regulators, um, uh, information intermediaries like HTA agencies and healthcare systems are working together uh, rather than just waiting for uh, you know, the regulator to finish, uh, then the healthcare system starts thinking about it. Um, and then there's a process of trying to find the money to adopt the new technology that actually uh, where it really works. And this is happening in a, 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 not just in a, a single country, but in lots of countries in Europe and elsewhere around the world. There's a recognition that uh, a conversation between uh, the key players involved in that chain of decision making that's going to enable access to a new technology, getting together as early as possible um, to have an open conversation about with companies about the nature of what they're bringing, about the evidence uh, package that's going to be available for decision makers, whether that's the regulator or the healthcare system, um, about ways in which that might be enhanced. Um, about the uncertainty associated with the new technology and about how that might be managed. All of those things are, uh, it's perfectly possible to have those conversations and they are starting to happen and they are starting to make a difference uh, in enabling uh, the elapsed time between a company being ready to put a new technology in place into a healthcare system um, and that technology being adopted. So. All of those things that I'm suggesting can happen and are happening. We just need to make sure that the, um, you know, the kind of business interaction between all of those players uh, becomes slicker, becomes earlier, becomes more efficient and becomes more routine. Yeah, probably collaboration and cooperation between key stakeholders in, in healthcare is the key and the answer for better health and care overall. Yeah. The next question is from the audience, so I'm going to uh, to read it. Would you agree that one of the main impediments of innovation-driven technologies in medicine is the need of breaking one of the great promises that was given by the pharma industry to the clinicians to work in risk-free environment in terms of therapeutics and devices? I'm sorry. Could you just repeat that question? I missed the. It's, it's a long one. Yes. Would you, would you agree that one of the main impediments of innovation driven technologies in medicine is the need of breaking one of the great promises that was given by pharma industry to cl clinicians to work in risk free environment in terms of therapeutics and devices? Um, I'm not sure I entirely follow uh, the question. Um, but if it's about um, if it's about uh, it sounds if, if it's sort of about the the message that pharma might have given to clinicians, clinicians, past, yeah, we're gonna, directly to clinicians, um, you know, that we're going to bring things uh, to you, and you can be confident that uh, when we say this is going to deliver what it's going to deliver, uh, then um, uh, you know you'll be able to use the technology. I, I think. I think I think we've all grown up um, over the last twenty to thirty years, um, recognizing that um, uh, that you know, however however convincing uh, and however convinced an innovator might be of their product, uh, that um, it nevertheless makes sense that at the point at which we start using it, we have a considered a process that enables us to take a considered decision about the potential value uh, of a new technology, <clears throat> the risks associated with that, the uncertainties around the evidence that's available, and then to take a measured decision about, with that information, about how to use that new technology in the healthcare system. Um, and I'm not sure about promises being broken. I think everybody, uh, has always gone into this with their with their eyes open and clinicians individually more than most have the ability to recognize very quickly uh, the extent to which something new is making a real difference for their patients compared to what they have available at the moment. Um, what we now have the potential to do is to 
um, inform individual clinical patient decisions about new technologies. Um, absolutely at the point at which a new technology becomes available so that we're not relying on the experience of individual clinicians as they use the new technologies that we can preload that experience as the new technology is introduced but we can only do that i think by recognizing uh, the differences in risk appetites and ambitions that the different players in the ecosystem have got and managing those things earlier through that earlier dialogue that i've suggested Great, thank you. I hope that this answers the questions uh, asked. And one more thing, you've mentioned that the common aim, aim of key stakeholders and the healthcare system too is to improve outcomes of patients, but are and how they are used as an evidence that innovation work. Um, outcomes of patients, are they used as an evidence uh, that innovations are here and they are working for the patients. Well, ultimately, that's that has to be the case uh, because what's the point? Should be. What's otherwise the point? Yes, um, I mean everybody's doing this genuinely. Everybody's doing this because uh, they ultimately want to improve uh, the experience that patients have of the disease and condition that they've got, and and ultimately, in the worst cases, to be able to either cure or certainly to significantly delay. Uh, uh, um, significant illness or death. So, if a new technology isn't doing that, why are we why are we investing huge amounts of resources uh, into uh, delivering it? It's also the case that uh, there are some. I, I mean, for diagnostics, uh, the relationship between uh, uh, a, a new diagnostic and therapeutic benefit is more distant than a treatment that's been introduced last line for treating cancer, for example. Um, so, you know, we have to be realistic about what we can know uh, at the point at which something new is introduced for the first time. Um, we can't know everything about its potential benefits. Some of the newer gene therapies, for example, are not going to reveal their true benefits for decades, uh, those that have the potential for, uh, uh, you know, for, for restoring substantial uh, life prospects. Uh, in those diseases which otherwise would uh, kill patients very early in their lives. So we have to be realistic about it. Um, but nevertheless, uh, with the tools and techniques that are available um, and with a shared understanding of risk, I think it is possible to make good quality judgments early on so that we avoid um, not taking advantage of new technologies uh, sooner and that we avoid uh, investing in new technologies that are coming through that simply don't have enough value relative to their cost. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there's no other questions from the audience, no from me. So thank you once again. It was a pleasure having you speaking today. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah.